My name is Stanley Sword, and I have the great pleasure to sit here with Professor in Political Science, Joran Hydén. Trevligt att träffas. Great, nice to meet you. Uh, and you've been working in three continents: Africa, Europe here in Sweden, and in America over a span of 60 years. You, you divided 20 years in Europe, 20 years in Africa, and 20 years in in America. But we just talked about where the greatest prospects for the future lie. And you told me about Costa Rica. Tell us about the glimmering future there. Well, uh, it's always difficult to find exactly one country or one case that answers all the questions regarding what one wants to see happening in the world. But my own experience, my own reading, is that uh, Costa Rica in Central America is probably as close to what one wants to see as any country that I can think of in the world. There might be others, but uh, my own limited experience, my own reading suggests that that particular country, Costa Rica, is a, a country that probably answers many questions that we have about what is good and what will be the future for those who invest or take an interest in making the world better. Yeah, <clears throat> and they also have a high degree of happiness in the happiness index. Yeah, I haven't necessarily uh, focused on the happiness index, but that obviously only reinforces the, the fact that uh, if people there are happy, uh, as they obviously claim they are, th that's another very strong reason why that country might go forward without having many of the problems that other countries will face. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and then you talked about another country with great uh, democracy, Switzerland. Yes, uh, with, in terms of how you resolve identity politics in a constructive way uh, is, I think, an increase, increasing challenge in m many parts of the world. And I think uh, uh, the federal solutions that a country like Switzerland have found should be one that is of particular interest to countries in Africa and elsewhere where you have either religious, racial or ethnic uh, groups making up the social structure of those countries. Mm -hmm. But Switzerland doesn't have a shoreline <laughs> that you can't fix. You they know, have many, many nice lakes, but they yeah, were right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And you yourself, you grew up with a lake in Jönköping mm -hmm. in Sweden. And we had a very nice view of the lake where we actually lived. So yeah. we were spoiled and my parents had great difficulty giving up on that. My mother had to give up on it when she got a little too old to live on her own. And, and it was uh, difficult. And for us who grew up as kids, yes, that's what we remember. Uh, Vetten was our sort of... Uh, lake and, and we had access to it uh, from our own uh, mm. uh, property. So uh, yes, I, it was interesting and it was rewarding in terms of saying I have actually grown up in a very beautiful environment and I'm grateful to it. Yeah. And a unique thing is that two of your brothers also became professors. <clears throat> yes. So you have the, the three professors. Yeah, and my, my, my sister, who is the fourth sibling, uh, she actually uh, got married to a, a professor. So uh -huh. we have had not only three, but four, <laughs> yeah. and we have met all of us together. Yeah. Mm. And, and how do you think 
it became that way. Three professors in one family. <laughs> yeah, and, a, and uh, my youngest brother, Håkan, and I are both, in a way, social scientists, although Håkan also has a, a legal background. He's a professor of sociology of law. Uh, my middle brother, Krista, is a professor of technology, uh, mainly focused on traffic safety. And uh, my sister got married to Professor Arne Melander, who is now passed away, but who was a very prominent uh, professor of medicine or pharmacology, more specifically, in Lund. Mm. <clears throat> so what did your mother and father do right or <laughs> do wrong in order to have three kids that became professors? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I can only think of it as a coincidence that we all ended up that way. I, I, you know, you could say that if, if the eldest son, me, became professor, it became sort of something that the others would also think of. I don't know. I never heard my younger brother say, I became a professor because my elder brother was yeah. one. So I think it has to do more with the fact that we've been relatively successful, every one of us, in our respective fields. Mm. And you yourself <clears throat> have three kids, mm. divided in, one in Sweden, one in Switzerland, and mm. one in America. Yeah. So you kind of, uh, you, it, you really ended up uh, having a, a global family. Yeah, and that's, uh, if not by coincidence, obviously, but it's a reflection of the fact that we have married, lived sir? in these three places. And I married, as you suggested, uh, uh, my wife is from Tanzania, so yeah. we have a connection to Africa through her. And the fact that we've lived there 20 years, we have uh, our connection to America uh, because I worked there for over 20 years. And our youngest son, who has actually grown up there, is the one who, you know, is sort of, I wouldn't necessarily call him an American, our American son, but he's the one who has sort of bring or keeps our ties with America. Yeah. And our daughter, who is in between the two sons, she is in Linköping and works in the private sector and, and uh, is doing well. And she is very Swedish, although she never came to Sweden mm. until she was 20 years. And your son in Switzerland is working with a non-profit for yeah, developing uh, he, Africa? He works with Africa, that's correct. So he's actually the one who has his eyes on Africa as much as anything else. And he does that for the uh, Lutheran World Federation mm. and works specifically on humanitarian assistance. And early on... <clears throat> You went abroad, you went to Africa. Mm. Tell us about your initial initial journeys in this vast continent. That well, I, I had prepared myself both uh, mentally and intellectually, if you want to call it that. Uh, you know, I was very successful when I passed my high school exam in Jönköping to write an essay for the exam, which actually addressed the question, one of the questions, which was, write something about Africa's future after Ghana's independence, which was the same year, 1957. And I was sufficiently informed about what was going on in Africa and Ghana in particular that of those six or eight topics that we were given, I was the only one that chose to write about Africa. And since I succeeded beyond my own expectations, I felt that that was a boost for my interest in Africa. So uh, when I was in Lund later on and studied political science, I actually continued to take an interest and got scholarship or actually a Rotary Foundation fellowship to go to University of California in Los Angeles uh, where they had a very good African study center and that's where I actually became uh, much much more uh, 
immersed in what it meant to study Africa. So that's how I prepared myself. And then when I first went to Africa in 1964... And there you got a good mentor as well. Yes, I had a very good uh, mentor, Professor James Coleman, who actually then, after that, also helped me to get uh, or to teach at uh, both... Makere University in Uganda and uh, Nairobi University uh, in Kenya because he had then moved to East Africa and was responsible for hiring uh, expatriate professors uh, in the social sciences. And in your PhD you, you used some of the ideas yeah. that he developed. Yeah, he was one of the pioneers of structural functionalism as it's called in English. Uh, which was an approach in the early, early 60s that drew together insights from anthropology and sociology and created a, what you might call a new political science that I was part of and I was excited because I was associated and had the benefit of advice from one of the pioneers himself. So, you know, I became my, my own dissertation work was very much influenced by this structural functionalist thinking, which, however, later on I have abandoned because I couldn't necessarily do as much with it as I had hoped. But nonetheless, that was my first introduction and to what theoretically was important about Africa. And Africa in these days, in the, in the early 60s, there were a lot of countries that came out of um, colo yeah. colonized by by uh, France and then a lot of mm. different European countries, so I guess there were optimism for the future. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Freedom no. and and uh, bright future. Yeah, it was uh, an exciting period to be in Africa in yeah. the 1960s, absolutely. It's and like I, in Silicon Valley today, perhaps. Yeah, I, that's probably <laughs> not, 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 not a bad comparison. I think, uh, of course, you know, the political independence that the African countries uh, acquired uh, through their own efforts, I would say, uh, was you know, something that gave Africa both a moral and political boost and make Afri made Africa part of the world mm. on a more equal footing than had been the case when they were just colonies. Mm. And um, therefore, uh, you know, Africans themselves were very uh, happy to take the lead. Uh, it was, I should say, a backside of that, and that was that many of the leaders who actually came to power came to power uh, under circumstances that led to uh, dictatorships and and um, mm -hmm. one party rules. Uh, so, in, in that sense, the political climate immediately after independence was, as you said if not euphoric, nonetheless, nonetheless very optimistic. But then came the reality. And then With came the Marxists reality, yeah. And, and, and dictators. And, 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 and the countries suffered in many cases yeah. from the backlash of dictators. There weren't much Swedish middle ground. There no. were a lot of extremists. But, but what, what do you think Africa today, what can they learn from their past and, and, and how can they go into a, brighter future once more because you, you really believe in mm. the future of Africa yeah no I think Africa is the future for the or, you know this uh, I believe because it has all the riches you know in terms of natural resources including also uh, you know uh, things that are both underground and and above ground I'm thinking about you know for instance for tourist purposes a lot of attractive uh, destinations, but that's so not the only thing. The Europe is the continent of the past, and, and Africa is the continent yeah, and, of the and, future, and, perhaps. And, and America, increasingly, the past too. Uh, I mean, in that sense, I think you know, uh, 
the, 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 the part of the world that we have looked upon as developing or underdeveloped or third world, I think is, is moving forward in ways that will make the rest of the world look as if they are, if not behind, nonetheless, not necessarily in the same position of leadership as we have seen during the last, say, 50, 60 years. You know, ever since the end of the Second World War, uh, especially, you know, it's been the Western countries that have set the global agenda through the United Nations. So which qualities should a great leader have? Well, uh, it's difficult again to say exactly, but, you know, obviously it must be somebody who is sufficiently reflective of what he is doing or what is going on. And I think that's when we talk about will African learn from their own experience. Uh, one thing that, you know, I haven't seen enough of in Africa, nor have I seen enough of it in many other countries, <laughs> but, but I think if you say Africa needs to learn from their own experience, then I think a reflective mind is clearly one asset that is much more important today than the idea that you can make your population enthusiastic about your own personal leadership, as was the case, you know, with the charismatic leaders like Julius Nyerere and Jomo Kenyatta and others uh, uh, 50 or 60 years ago when people were sort of very much, uh, shall we say, uh, inspired by their personal yeah. charisma or leadership. And today there's a lot of Chinese companies and, and the Chinese government coming to Africa to invest. And they're taking their employees to Africa as well. There's like, we moved here from Europe to, to the States a hundred years ago, and now a lot of Chinese <clears throat> are moving to Africa. Yeah, I think, you know, we talk about Chinese investments in Africa. We talk about possible Chinese exploitation of African resources. Uh, but, you know, the, the most interesting thing in my view is that uh, what we see in African countries is, if not a mass immigration, nonetheless a significant immigration of Chinese people, citizens, to Africa for purposes of staying in Africa. And, you know, that's something that is often overlooked because when you go to places, especially in East Africa, but even increasingly in some West African countries, you find that much of the retail shops or business is actually done by Chinese these days. Mm. They used to be either uh, Indians or uh, Africans, but it's increasingly Chinese. And, and that's, uh, you know, a, a presence that uh, maybe would become much more controversial when uh, this group uh, really uh, takes over a significant part of local business. Yeah, so what threats, opportunities are, uh, and changes are lying in the future as you see it? You mean in Africa? No? Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, as I said, I think what you will see is, to begin with, an increasing rift or sh gap between rich and poor. Uh, despite all the efforts to reduce poverty by the international community, uh, the, 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 the economic and social change process in African countries point in the opposite direction and it's not necessarily going to be any change in that pattern for some years to come. And I say so because I think <clears throat> Sweden and other countries that want to see reduced poverty cannot really expect that they can solve that issue from the outside with money or with ideas. It has to come through lo 
you know, local African experiences and encounters. Mm. So what I'm saying is that when you begin to have a middle class in Africa that is really strong, but also beginning to be somewhat more confident of itself, I think you will see African leaders or African businessmen, African middle class in general, much more attuned to the idea that, yes, we have an interest of our own in making the poor better off. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, for nowadays you don't see much awareness of the idea that, you know, the rich should share with the poor, except within uh, limited, you know, family or uh, such circles. So it's, 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 that's going to happen. So my, my own sense is that greater equality in Africa will come, if not in this generation, the next generation, and it will take its time because it all depends on the extent to which you first have a self-confident mm -hmm. middle class made up of people from those countries. And early on, with the Western aid, or at least the Swedish aid, we weren't so interested in, in democracy. We were focused on, on developing the economy and rising the, uh, the poverty line, so to say. Well, the Swedish aid, in my view, has been sort of in, in two extremes in a way of, you know, in the beginning, during the 1960s, 70s and into the 80s, the Swedish aid, and I would add, uh, in all fairness, that it was not only Sweden, many other countries had the same approach. They were not interested in democracy, but they were interested in development. And development, therefore, was something that had a, you know, was an end in itself. So whether it was by dictators, whether it was by Democrats, or other means than dictatorship, the, 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 the donors didn't intervene and say, we can't give you money because you're not democratic. Mm. The idea that you can only give money to countries that are democratic only came in the 90s, 1990s. And that's when the shift from development to democratic governance or democrat, democracy, where mm. the Swedish and many of the other countries say, you will not develop in Africa unless you accept our advice to practice democratic governance. Mm. And that's what they have been doing for the last 30 years or 50, 25 years, perhaps. Uh, my sense is that <clears throat> that agenda is on its way out now and that the African countries are sufficiently uh, strong enough today, both economically and perhaps politically, that they will be actually claiming ownership of any external resources, foreign aid that is, that they haven't necessarily done in the past, which means that the Swedish and other countries their aid has to be sort of given not on Western terms, on the donor's terms, but mm. more and more on the recipient terms. Mm. And uh, early on, at the age of 37, you became a professor in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and you created two expressions that you are proud of. <laughs> in, in your, in your, in well, your, uh, two, life. Two, two concepts, I should call them, yeah. that have stayed with not just me, but with others who have been studying. Africa. Your legacy. Yeah, my, you can call it my legacy if you. That's, uh, the, the first one is the economy of affection, which is you know, the idea that there is an alternative economy uh, in Africa that operates outside of the market uh, principles and outside mm -hmm. of the state. Not uh, capitalism, not socialism. Exactly. Something but it's, it's something that is community-based or communal in character, which means that uh, 
you know, you, you have exchanges both for good and for bad, but typically for good. Uh, you know, like, for instance, families, members helping each other, uh, communities investing in a common project. Or, you know, if you want to call it less, well, more controversial, maybe uh, the idea that, you know, a politician uh, give handouts to their followers in order to buy their support, mm -hmm. which is also a common way of thinking about how this works. Uh, so that's the concept number one. The concept number two is governance, which uh, uh, I was actually working with uh, before anyone else did, as far as I can see, at least in academic circles. And I believe at least others have credited having been inside the World Bank. Uh, they have credited me with the introduction of the governance concept in the World Bank which stems from the fact that I, in 1988, wrote a background paper for a 1989 World Bank report on Africa, uh, where, the, where in my paper I introduced the concept of governance, and the people on the bank side, the people who eventually wrote the report and uh, sort of spread the concept of governance, uh, were, you know, uh, instrumental in taking that uh, into what is essentially uh, the, the, the operational mode of the World Bank. And governance, tell us what, what is that? Well, governance is uh, a multi-institutional way of conducting politics for public purposes. That is to say, governance is more than the state, it's more than the government because it involves other institutions, non-governmental institutions, private sector for that matter, but typically civil society and government uh, doing things together. Uh, and it, it, in that sense, it has a democratic component uh, or a democratic uh, aspect to it, which uh, other donors have clearly also latched on to. Uh, uh, although, for instance, Sweden, uh, at least in Swedish aid policy, they typically talk about <coughs> democratic development or democracy more than they talk about democratic governance, although governance is there to some extent. But uh, I think the, the, the World Bank was particularly happy about the concept because they find themselves in a position where they, as a bank, cannot really sort of talk politics in the same way as, for instance, CEDA or other bilateral donors can do. So <laughs> I was, in a way, you know, providing Solution. the World Bank with a, a concept that pro allowed them to talk about democracy or uh, uh, democratic development without necessarily using that word. And the, the economy of affection mm. sounds beautiful. It sounds uh, like something we should have here, perhaps. And I think, something that is getting popular now with, with you know, small farmers, mm, small yeah. brewers of beer, you know, and, and, and the hipsters are going out in the, in the, in yeah. the country to, to, to live a life near yeah. the, uh, nature. No, you're absolutely right. I think this idea of sharing economics, uh, you know, that you, uh, is, which is, I think, what the economy of affection is all about, is, is also coming to developed countries, including Sweden. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the idea that everything can be done uh, the way we have been used to or been brought up on by capitalism or socialism or a combination of the two as in Sweden, I think uh, l limits our own appreciation of the fact that things can be done differently and things are being done differently in Africa. The economy of affection is still very much alive, despite mm -hmm. the fact that its principles, or you might say its origin, is uh, in pre-colonial features of Africa, in other words, Africa before it was colonized. Yeah.
Tell us about the roots. How, how, how long back can you trace that? Economy of affection. Well, uh, anthropologists obviously have studied this, historians have studied it, it's been there. And you know, it's fair to say that uh, if you go 100 or 200 years back in Swedish history, you would find the economy of affection here too. Mm. So it's a pre capitalist, pre socialist form of economics that, you know, is shall we say, attuned to the fact that uh, in the past in Sweden and in the past in Africa, but even today in many parts of Africa, in other words, contemporary Africa, you find that communities are still operating quite independently of the state mm -hmm. and of the market. You might say they have one foot in the market, but they have the other foot in the economy of affection. So they, 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 they use this economy of affection as a complement, if nothing else, to achieve things. For instance, you know, if you have a relative who falls ill and you don't have the money to take that person to the hospital or buy the medication that is necessary, you know, the idea that a relative or somebody else nearby provides that money without saying, pay me back, is essentially happening on a daily basis in Africa. Mm. And it happens on a larger scale than just the two individuals in the family. Uh, you know, it happens in terms of, for instance, people making loans to each other. Um, like a microloan uh, Exactly, women, up, women groups, up. you know, they can call them micro-savings or micro-credits groups. Uh, are an example of how people organize this a little more formally than, you know, the, the example I gave before. Yeah. So the Western world can start to learn from Africa and import some of their economic... Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, the, the people who work in the non-governmental sector here in Europe or in Sweden who have experience of working in Africa who I think are open and have taken some of these ideas to Sweden. So when we talk about alternative economies in Sweden, or we talk about alternative development, you know, on a small scale, uh, you know, many of these ideas that are now being practiced in Sweden or in Europe, in small groups, uh, they, yes, they, they, I can claim that I know that they are inspired by what it's going on in Africa, but it's very similar. And my suspicion is, or my assumption is, that some of these ideas are actually having their origin in an African experience. Yeah. And then you start to work for the Ford mm -hmm. Foundation. Mm -hmm. And you meet up with a lot of interesting people, like yeah. McNamara, yeah, who Robert are the McNamara. head of the World mm -hmm. Bank. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Those experiences. Well, it was a good experience for me in terms of learning the fact that <laughs> if you are an academic, you never get exposed to being a manager yeah. or knowing what to, how to do things. My experience in, in, with Ford from 1978 to 1985 was essentially divided into two. The first two years, I was a social science research advisor working with universities and individual researchers in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, because uh, I was then promoted to become the representative or director of the Office for Eastern and Southern Africa, I also had to take on a much bigger role of being involved in administration and management. It wasn't a big office. We were only five professionals and then a local staff of another 10. So 15 people was all I had responsibility for, but it was a good learning experience. And although I had never become again a full-time manager, the ideas and experience I had with the Ford Foundation taught me a lot of things that were helpful when I returned in 1986 to teach at the University of Florida and eventually become involved in administering parts of the departmental uh, agenda. In, uh, I became 
graduate coordinator, which meant that I was administratively as well as intellectually coordinating the doctoral program. And in the end of your African journey of 20 mm. years, you became the leader <clears throat> in uh, a part of the Ford Foundation. Well, uh, what, I, what, what we did in the Ford Foundation during the time I was there was to perhaps... Restructure it. Yeah, we were restructuring the program in such a way that instead of providing technical assistance to governments, which had been the mainstay of what Ford had been doing from 1960 or onwards, uh, we, we shifted our focus to non-governmental organizations or civil society. So we, our mission, if you want to call it that, or our objective was to help develop civil society in those countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. And we had some success with that, but uh, we also learned some of the pitfalls uh, of giving money to organizations that cannot necessarily finance themselves as easily. And how can failures lead to success? Well, in this case, I suppose we all learned, and they learned as well, that they need to be able to raise... I think the, the first thing was to raise money from more than one source. The second one, which is a more difficult one, was to try to find local sources of funding. But, uh, you know, in countries where the middle class is small, Uh, uh, and there, there is no tradition of voluntarism like we have in many developed countries. It was it was taking time, and I think it's still work in progress in the sense that uh, um, many of these soci civil society organizations face the problem: how can we become self-reliant? Yeah, <clears throat> and tell us about your meetings with. McNamara and other, <laughs> other icons? Well, um, my, my own sense was that, uh, you know, he, well, let me say first of all that he, he was on the board of the Ford Foundation uh, and, and he was there together with uh, a, a group of other very prominent people from both the private sector in America, uh, academics and diplomats, So, you know, it, it, it was about a 12-person board. And uh, what I remember is that uh, Robert McNamara, of course, was the, 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 the most well-known, but he was also the best spoken of all these people because he really knew his subject matter. And he was often the one that people listened to. And uh, I felt myself, having listened to him and sat in on a couple of board meetings, that, yes, he, he was clearly a leader, but one, he was also a person who did not necessarily, despite all his prominence and his knowledge, making a lot of it. And he was, in my view, much more humble as a person in that context than I had expected he would be. <laughs> and if you were to give out the Nobel Prize in your own field, political science or some related to it, who, who would get it? Well, it, it depends uh, today or, you know, if you say... You can choose <laughs> for a time. Well... Uh, It's hard to say. I mean, I, first of all, I think it would have, I would have to limit myself not to political science at large, but maybe to the field of comparative politics, which is a subfield in political science where I have been working because my research has been on Africa and that's, you know, falls within what we call comparative politics. But <clears throat> I think there are a um, couple of names that come to mind, although, again, it's difficult to choose. Um, But there are often three persons, maximum three persons who get, get the same Nobel Prize. So you can, uh, you can pick two, uh, but they only get half the price on each. Mm. 
Well, I, I would mention uh, one who actually got the Nobel, Nobel Prize in economics already, which is Douglas North, who has been very influential in political science. The same may apply to Eleanor Ostrom, who was also a Nobel Prize winner, and who, ha who was a political, both of these are political scientists, but they were actually rewarded in economics. And because they were re rewarded in economics, it's not the only reason I think they had, they have been very influential in shaping the thinking about institutionalism in political science, both in comparative politics and the political science field at large. And I think those two would definitely belong there. If what, you, what, what, what have they done? What, what well, the, 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 the idea is that you know, they, are, they reacted against the idea that there is a perfect market or that individuals are sort of free wheeling uh, individuals who can choose pretty much in, in you know, the way they want in terms of what is in their interest. So they, they, their main contribution is that they actually argue that institutions, rules, shape the way we can actually uh, make our choices. So we are not completely free. We are actually confined by rules or institutions. That's the same word actually, or same meaning. And uh, so, Karl can see uh, Sartre and Kierkegaard was wrong. Yeah, the in that free sense, will. yeah, the, the 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 free will, whether it's Adam Smith or Sir Kierkegaard, I think uh, you know they they're certainly being questioned uh, by both these two guys, uh, woman Ellen Ostrom and and Douglas North. Uh, my own sense in relation to their role as leading figures in our political science is that. They, my, my own feeling is that they, there is no interest since they focus on what limits human agency or human will. But institutions themselves have their own roots in society. So what I'm actually saying that there are too many or there are too little research on the structural fundament or foundation of institutions, which means, you know, you need to look at the social and economic circumstances in which institutions rise. And that's what I think is, in a way, missing in relation to what has been happening in uh, political science in the last 20 or so years. And I would, uh, you know, point in the direction of another old person in the field, uh, Canadian, actually sociologist, but again with a lot of influence in political science, called Seymour Martin Lipset, who was much more aware of the fact that democracy, for instance, doesn't necessarily grow and flourish just in any social or economic setting. Uh, and his work from the late 50s and early 60s goes in the direction of suggesting that there is you know, correlation between democracy and society uh, is one that uh, needs to be examined. And far too little has been done by, I think, academics as well as policy analysts in recent years because there's been this optimism in both circles, that institutions is what shape choice, not necessarily go all the way back and look at what structures uh. determine. And why should young people today go into political science? Why should they dedicate their lives? Well, that's also a good question, given that there's so much emphasis on science, technology and medicine these days. Yeah. Uh, but my own feeling is that... Uh, whether it's political science or any of the social sciences or the humanities, they clearly have a role in, in not only uh, university life, but also in public life. 
And my sense is that the emphasis that is now on social, on science and technology and medicine is going to last for some time, but it's not there for, for, forever. It's not necessarily going to be as dominant because we will soon realize that whether it's innovations or any other things that come out of science and technology, or even medicine, uh, you know, have consequences for people and society. Mm. And as a result of that, you have to go back and see, you know, ask a political scientist or sociologist or somebody to actually take a look at this. So th this is a sort of a question of, you know, up and down or balancing and what we see today, as I said, is not necessarily what we'll see tomorrow. Mm. <clears throat> and what advice could you give to persons who want to become researchers, make a PhD? How do you become successful? <laughs> or yeah, you... no, you, you 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 obviously need to work hard yourself, but you yeah. also need to have a good advice. You can't outsource it. No, definitely okay. not. And 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 you know, as I said, my own experience is that. Uh, you know, uh, having a good tutor or having a good mentor is, mm. is, is, is also very important. And I think, you know, one of the sad things is that there is there are often not enough time devoted to students' development, mm. partly because there are too many doctorants or students mm. or graduate students, or the professor not taking enough interest in his or her students. And that means, you know, that they don't become as good as the professor himself because they don't necessarily get the advice that they should get. And how old is political science? <laughs> it goes all the way back to Aristotle and Plato. Yeah. So, you know, the the the, the Principles in Plato's writing, there's empirical reflections, uh, very interesting in Aristotle. And of course, you know, since then, other big names is um, Machiavelli, mm -hmm. who was, you know, advisor to the Prince of Florence, uh, the Medici, and, uh, you know, who, who was essentially the person who said, you know, you know, you you, you have to be a, a, a politician, you have to be a person who only looks after your interest in a way that you don't, so you don't lose power. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, a question of how, how does a, a, a person stay, in, stay power. in power for good or, you know, as long as he or she wants. Yeah, his books. Yeah. Staying in power anyway for yeah. decades to come. Yeah. And then you move over the seas to another continent. You get a job at uh, Dartmouth. Well, that was only on the sabbatical leave, so it was temporary. Yeah. I and didn't have a position there, but I was there as a guest, visiting professor, whatever you call it. And you mm -hmm. got the opportunity to become a professor at the University of Florida. Yeah, that's correct. And that's when I was at Dartmouth. I was invited to go to for an interview at the University of Florida, and I was successful. And uh, because they had an African Studies Center, my wife got a job as well. How do you uh, land a professorship? But you you, you did it well, once before. Well, obviously in Africa. I had a track record because I had written already books and articles, and people had enough. Should you be extra well-spoken when you study political science? Well, uh, well-spoken in what sense do you mean? Smooth well. words or, <laughs> or, or, or spoken well about the subject matter? I mean, you studied, you know, since Aristotle and, and forward, yeah. all the people that got to rule the world, and, and they, they must be well-spoken. Yeah. No, but, you know, when you go for an interview, uh, I don't know here in Sweden, but in America at least, you know, you face a department of maybe 25, 30 or more people, many of whom come from different angles of political science than you do. And the 
challenge is not necessarily to just say, you know, this is what I've done, mm. but to be able to answer all kinds of tough questions that come from these other political scientists who, deliberately or not, ask this question to see whether you can stand on your feet. Mm. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I, I was presumably doing well enough in terms of answering questions of colleagues who didn't know much about my work. And as a result, you know, they re recommended me for this position as full professor. Yeah, of the best Africa Institute in, in North America. Yes, uh, University of Florida uh, has, at least today, the best African studies center in America. By the time I was there, it was not necessarily already the best because it was on the way up, but, but probably among the ten best at that time. So, uh, you helped a lot of students throughout the years. Mm. You, you uh, worked for 20 years mm. in Florida yeah. and developed uh, this uh, university and, and, and the field of political science in, in Africa. Tell us about the most inspiring and, and, and interesting um, experiments and, and, and studies that you made. Your research. Well, my own research in Florida was very much more interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary because I worked with colleagues who were in other fields, including tropical agriculture, uh, law. Uh, so, you know, I, I was often expanding my own interest as well as my own knowledge mm -hmm. by working with other people on issues in Africa that I had not necessarily worked with before. So my inspiration there was that I was able to A, work with new people who were in different fields and learn what, how they looked at development, for instance, and, and B, that I was able to actually, you know, go to Africa and, and find myself involved in new areas that I knew were important, but I had not necessarily done before. Mm. So, uh, I mean, or worked in before. And you moved to Gainesville. Mm -hmm. How is it to root yourself in American society? I was lucky. I didn't find it very difficult. And I think, uh, you know, Gainesville is a small town. It didn't take too long time to know where you were. University was dominant. University was good. Uh, colleagues were fine. Students uh, appreciative of what I was doing. So, you know, even from the start on, I, I, I felt things were going the right way. And, you know, uh, that part of Florida, which is actually in North Central Florida, is, is, is still much, much more, shall we say, original Florida, original South then, for instance, if you go towards Miami in particular, where everything has been built up, and, <laughs> and you know, they, you, you don't know what Florida is all about if you go to Miami. I mean, you, everyone, of course, thinks of Miami as, the, as Florida, yeah. but uh, Gainesville is the opposite. It's more like Fallen or Boiling or <laughs> something like that, Jungby. Yeah, <laughs> small town. Small town. The only thing is, as I said, you know, with the university of 50,000, mm. uh, you, you, it's a, you know, and the town had about 100,000. Yeah. So you can imagine the university was really dominant. And how <clears throat> come America is so good at academic research? Well, I think they've invested in it, you know, and, and, and that was one of the things I mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, the, the Florida legislature was sufficiently uh, caring about the quality of the university system in the state and especially the quality of the University of Florida, which was the sort of flagship university out of 10 mm. such state universities in Florida. Uh, 
that uh, you know they were ready to give money uh, so that you know the ambition that the University of Florida had and still has, I think, is to you know be one of the top ten research universities in Af- in America. Yeah. <clears throat> so, does they have another mindset as well compared to European researchers or? I'm not sure if I can say. I mean, it's uh, how shall I say? I, I uh, here I'm perhaps not necessarily sure of what I'm saying, but my own sense is that the, there's much more space for doing things, even in state universities in America, than that seems to be here in 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 most European countries. They are. Universities are sort of part of a long state tradition, uh, uh, you know, conventions that I, at least the way I see it, seems to have more impact on how people are thinking. You know, that includes the career system as well yeah. than, than, for instance, in the U.S. So, which advice could you give, give to people who want to emigrate to either the United States or Africa? (laughs) Well, the obvious thing is that, you know, you need to know that if you go there, that you are wanted or that, you know, there is some way that you can actually fit in. Uh, Because if you don't, uh, you know, you either become alienated because no one necessarily appreciates what you can offer and and uh, you know you need to be especially if you go to africa culturally sensitive in a way that you know you don't necessarily have to if you plan your career here in sweden or in europe so you know in that sense uh, you have to be an open minded person you have to be flexible in the way you you actually both think and act Mm. And, uh, you know, ready to adjust, uh, you know, there's both a give and take here. Yeah. So it's a, it's a more movable market for, for, mm. for people today, getting jobs in different continents and so on. Yeah. You yourself, you just moved back to, to Sweden. But which would be the three best countries in the world for, for the decades to come if... if one were to to uh, move out to search well the, uh, the question is do you have to move out if you include three i think sweden is one of the countries which is actually doing very well in political science and you know there are institutions departments of political science in Göteborg, in uppsala lund all those three universities have high class political science mm. uh, Departments and and uh, so, but if you have to move, move out for you know, starting a business yeah. or just the free. Well, if you go to other, if if you go outside of Sweden, I would think that, uh, well, b- besides the U.S., uh, I think Britain would be my my case. If you are interested in postmodernism, which is a minor sort of interest among most political scientists, but does exist. Uh, I, I think there are institutions or departments in France, especially in Paris and Bordeaux, that I would recommend. And, you know, countries like Germany and Holland have good political science departments in many places. And again, they are both influenced by Anglo Saxon thinking as well as the French modern or postmodernist thinking. Do you have any other passions in, in life? Uh, sports probably yeah. but I, I don't practice sports anymore and I've never been a star in any particular field but you know I'm, a, I'm very interested and follow as much as I can three things uh, in Sweden uh, and even when I'm outside Sweden I follow Swedish soccer or football mm. uh, I'm uh, very much into American football, especially since University of Florida has one of the best 
college teams in, in the country. And similarly with basketball, which has been even more of my passion in a way. And again, because the University of Florida has been very successful in the U.S. at the collegiate level and, you know, has made both me and my wife real basketball fans. Mm. So, you know, other than that, nowadays, because, you know, of age, I limit my exercise to the gym or to walking. Walking towards the future. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thank you for an inspirational yeah. conversation and the best of luck in, in, uh, in the you. years to come. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much.